All right, so what do chief cells secrete? Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, which is a zymogen, an inactive form of an enzyme. And what does it become? It becomes pepsin, the active, the active form. How? The acid in the stomach, the pH of the stomach. That cleaves the ogen part and makes it a pepsin. What do mucus secreting cells secrete? Easy. Mucus. Okay. <clears throat> this. All right. So right here, this is just like PhD stuff. I'm not sure what he wants us to know on this stuff. I haven't seen. I have yet to see a question on it. So we're gonna move on. Okay. So right here, again, it starts to get a little redundant here. Uh, uh, but more specific though. He, right here we have gastrin. What did I say about gastrin? It responds to um, distension. I'll talk more about that. How that happens. Um, CCK, cholecystokinin, responds to fat and amino acids. I talked about that. Where do you find it in the in the duodenum, in the small intestine? What does it do? Gallbladder contraction, relaxation of the sphincter of Odi. It also tells the pancreas to release some enzymes. Secretin. Who secretes the So CCK is secreted by I cells. Secretin is secreted by S cells. What do S? What does secretin do? Like I said, it does a few things, but the main thing it does is pancreatic aqueous secretion, bicarb, bicarbonate. I talked about GIP, also known as a gastric inhibitory peptide, but but known as glucose-dependent insulin otropic polypeptide. What is the response to glucose? Where is it? Small intestine. What does it do? Insulin secretion. Um, I talked about histamine. And what does histamine do? It, it, it binds to the H2 receptor on the parietal cell and tells the parietal cells to secrete acid. Motilin, what is that? Interdigestion, when you're not eating, when you when in between meals, when you're asleep. How does it work? MMC. What does MMC stand for? Migrating motor complex. What does it do? Clean out your small, clean out your GI tract, dead bacteria, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, this is a good place where I can start talking about, uh, somatostatin stuff. Um, okay, so, somatostatin, right? Somatostatin's over here. It's secreted by D cells. By the way, D cells are all over the GI. I know this image has it on the antrum, but D cells are all over the GI. I mean, just look at this table over here. Somatostatin is all over the GI. F stands for fundus, A stands for antrum, D stands for duodenum, uh, jejunum, ileum, and C stands for colon, right? Somatostatin. Whenever I think about somatostatin, stat reminds me of stasis. Or you're frozen, right? Nothing's happening. And that's exactly what it does. Somatostatin is a turn-off hormone. It turns everything off. It inhibits everything. And just here's like a good, basically a good thing what it does, right? Somatostatin, over here, it inhibits gastric secretion. It inhibits pancreatic exocrine secretion, and it inhibits gastric motility. So a good way I memorize that is somatostatin does stasis. It turns everything off. So with that, let's answer this question. All right, 21 says, which hormone is responsible for stimulating hydrochloric acid secretion? Okay, who secretes hydrochloric acid in the GI? The parietal cell, right? Parietal cell secretes gastric acid. Who stimulates the parietal cell to secrete gastric acid? 
Hag. What is Hag? Histamine, acetylcholine, gastrin. Where does the histamine come from? ECL cells. Who stimulates the ECL cells? Gastrin. Where does the gastrin come from? G cells. Well, who the hell stimulates the G cells? Gastrin releasing protein. Who stimulates that? That that's coming off of the cells that are being stimulated by acetylcholine from the vagus nerve, cranial nerve ten. Bada bing, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, where does acetylcholine come from? Up oh, that same vagus nerve goes to some other ganglion, and that secretes acetylcholine. And then where does the gastrin come from? The G cells that secrete gastrin. Which one of these say that? C. C says gastrin. Now you're probably going to want to split. Yeah, C, C, C is the only one. Yeah. All right. Um, what does CCK do? CCK, pro-digestion, right? It's going to constrict the gallbladder to release bile. Where's that bile going to go? It has to go into the duodenal lumen. How? Relax the sphincter of Odi. Okay. What else is going to do? Uh, tell the pancreas to secrete some enzymes, right? I'll talk more about those enzymes later. Uh, what else is it going to do? Tell the stomach to throw out all of its contents, you know, release, release whatever what's in the stomach. Pro-digestion. Um, insulin. What does insulin have to do with GI? Well, who's going to tell insulin? Insulin is going to be released be, by the pancreas due to GIP. GIP is that guy who has like three nicknames, right? Uh, so GIP, the way I memorize GIP is by the 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 best one is glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide, which means that these K cells that secrete GIP respond to glucose, and they tell the pancreas to secrete insulin. Secretin. What does secretin have to do with GI? Secretin is secreted by S cells in response to amino acids and it secretes secretin. And what does secretin do? It tells the pancreas to secrete bicarb. Alright, so you can see how they can approach this question through a number of they, would just, they could literally just change one word and it could be a completely different question. So, I've been talking about acetylcholine a lot, right? Acetylcholine, acetylcholine. Whenever you think acetylcholine, you should think parasympathetic, right? That's the way we kind of memorize parasympathetics is when we think parasympathetic, we think acetylcholine. What do you guys think about when you think sympathetic? Well, when I think about sympathetic, I think about, uh, I think about epinephrine norepinephrine and the one test makers love to test on acetylcholine wait a minute what do you mean about acetylcholine remember your sweat glands that dr shaw talked about in histology of the skin lecture sympathetics are in charge of sweating you sweat because of sympathetic excitation those sweat glands the the acrine ones uh, at the apricot ones, those respond to acetylcholine, right? And then I believe it was the eccrine one that respond to the catecholamines. Mm. Okay, but enough about that, right? So, as I talked about right here, um, okay, remember the plexuses that I mentioned? You have a submucosal plexus. What is the other name for the submucosal plexus? Meisner's plexus, right? Meisner's plexus. Meisner's plexus. What is the Meisner's plexus going to do? Well, what's in the submucosa? Submucosal glands. Ah, okay. Myenteric plexus. What's the other name for the myenteric plexus? Auerbach. 
I'm not sure if I'm spelling this right, but our Bach plexus. Where is the our Bach plexus? In the muscularis externa layer. Where exactly? It's going to be in between the longitudinal layer and the circular layer. You'll find all of those nerve bodies right there. Hmm, okay. Uh, so right here, this is a really good, this is a really good slide right here. It shows you the sympathetic and the parasympathetic innervation of the GI. High yield right here is definitely the vagus nerve. Now you can see that the vagus nerve, if you were to trace it, you can see that the vagal nerve innervation, actually the vagal nerve innervation actually ends right here. Right here, this area at the, we call this the splenic flexure. Why do we call it a splenic flexure? Because the spleen is right there. So in between the descending colon and the middle colon, at the end of the middle colon or the transverse colon and at the beginning of the descending colon, that's where vagal, that's where parasympathetic switches. Parasympathetic switches from vagus innervation to pelvic innervation, right? We always talk about the parasympathetics being um, cranial, being, being um, cranial sacral. And we talk about the sympathetics being thoracolumbar, right? Because the cell bodies of the cere of the, the cell bodies of the sympathetic nervous system are in the thoracolumbar region, T1 to L3. The cell bodies for the parasympathetic nervous system are in your cervical ganglia, uh, uh, cranial ganglia because of the vagus nerve, and your sacral ganglia because of the pelvic nerve, right? Pelvic nerve. To be more specific, your pelvic splanchnic. Splanchnic nerves. All right. So, and as you can see right here, okay, so let's just answer a few questions on this. Let's answer a few questions on this. So, let's look at number 15 and go ahead and answer it with your best shot. All right, so number 15 says, the nerves responsible for increasing peristalsis in the descending colon is... So first of all, what are we talking about? Are we talking about nerves from where? Is it sympathetic or parasympathetic? Well, if we're talking about increasing peristalsis, increasing GI motility, then we're talking about parasympathetics. And parasympathetics to the descending colon... Ah, remember what I said, remember what I said. If I were to draw, if I were to draw your ascending colon, and then your transverse colon, and then your descending colon, then you have the sigmoid. Um, if I were to draw like this, and I were to say that your vagus innervation does everything in the GI up until the splenic flexure, then who takes over? The person that takes over are your pelvic splanchnic nerves, right? So the descending colon, which is right here, belongs to C, your pelvic splanchnic nerves. Mm, interesting. What if I told you instead of increasing peristalsis, I said decreasing peristalsis, the opposite of GI motility, the opposite of feed and breed is, or, or, or rest and digest, the opposite of that is fight or flight, sympathetic. There are three ganglia, sympathetic ganglia involved in GI. The celiac ganglion, the superior mesenteric ganglion, and the inferior mesenteric ganglion. That's a lot. How do I know what part of GI is being is coming from the ciliac sympathetics, the superior mesenteric sympathetics, or the inferior mesenteric sympathetics. Luckily for you guys, sympathetics follow blood vessels. They hitchhike on blood vessels. So guess what? 
everything innervated by the celiac trunk? I mean, any, anything that anything that the celiac trunk, the artery, supplies, is also innervated by the celiac ganglion. Everything that the superior mesenteric artery supplies is also innervated by the superior mesenteric ganglion. Everything that everything supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery is also innervated by the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So if you know your arteries, if you know your blood supply to the GI, you know your sympathetics to the GI. So with that, let's answer this question. Let's dig on number 17. Go ahead and give it your best shot. All right, 17 says, which nerves are responsible for decreased blood flow to the ascending colon? Ah, so we're decreasing blood flow. When we want to do that, well, if you're running away, if you're running away from a bear, if you're running away, this is my bear. If you're running away from a bear, um, do you want blood flow to the GI or away from the GI? You want blood flow away from the GI. You want as little as blood flow as possible to GI. If a bear is coming at you, you don't want your your you don't want your nerves to be like, I think right now is a good time to start digesting that sandwich you ate earlier. Nah, you want that must you want that you want that blood supply to go to your skeletal muscles so you can get the hell out of there, right? So this is your sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight or flight. Because we're decreasing blood flow to the GI. And what what part of the GI? The ascending colon. Hmm. What artery innervate what artery gives blood to the ascending colon? Should be the right colic artery. What is that a branch of? The superior mesenteric artery. So what's innervating the ascending colon? Branches from the superior mesenteric ganglion. That's your answer. Sympathetics follow blood supply. Sympathetics follow blood supply. If you know the blood supply, you know the sympathetic innervation. Easy as that. Here's just, here's just a, uh, if you don't, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys had a lecture on this already. As you can see right here, you have the superior mesenteric artery comes down right here. It does the right colic artery, which gives blood supply to your ascending colon, uh, right colic artery. It also does your, um, is there a superior mesenteric artery? It also does the transverse colon via the middle colic artery, so it gives blood supply to this. And then you have right here, you have your inferior mesenteric artery, which comes out right there. And your inferior mesenteric artery branches off. It gives a branch called your left colic artery. Your left colic artery is going to give blood to the the, uh, the descending colon, and it also has these sigmoid branches that are going to give blood to the sigmoidal colon, right? And don't forget, sympathetics are hitch sympathetics are wrapped around all of these arteries to go to their proper GI destination. So, like I said, uh, also don't forget right here is you have the splenic flexor. We call this area, we call this area right here the splenic flexor because your spleen, your spleen organ is right here. Um, and, and, and so right here is where the vagus, up, up until this part, the vagus cranial nerve 10 is doing the parasympathetic component. component. And then after that, you have your uh, pelvic uh, splanchnic doing the parasympathetic nervous system component. Let's look at some more questions, just to hammer this stuff down. Look, let's look at number 10. What does number 10 say? Which is innervated by pelvic splanking nerves? OK, remember I said, if we look at the colon, if we know the colon, if we know the colon, we know that the vagus stops right here. Up until here, we have cranial nerve 10. After that, everything after that, the pelvic splanking nerves take over. So which one of those says that? Your appendix? No, that will be vagal. Ascending colon, that will be vagal. Duodenum, vagal. Ilium, vagal. Oh, your sigmoid colon, right? Your sigmoid colon. That's the answer. Let's look at this one. Number 19. Autonomic fibers reach the descending colon primarily through the... So remember what I said, let's look at the, the colon again. We have the ascending, the middle, the descending, the sigmoid. 
right? Up until up until here, everything is cranial nerve 10, then it switches to pelvic pelvic splanking, right? Parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so, so it says autonomic though. Autonomic means both sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. So this is one of those questions that can go either way on the answer. So what do we know about the descending colon? We know that the parasympathetic is pelvic splanchnic. And what artery gives blood supply to the descending colon? The left colic artery. The left colic artery is a branch of what? The inferior mesenteric artery. So therefore, we can, talk, we can say that the inferior mesenteric ganglion is in charge of the sympathetics. Let's see which one is saying that. Left greater splanchnic nerve. I'm not sure what that is. But then there may be power. Inferior rectal plexus. Mm. Left colic plexus. Okay, right? Colic plexus, superior mesenteric plexus. Okay. The answer here is going to be C. Why? Remember what I said is that you have sympathetics innervate uh, in, sympathetics innervate organs via the blood supply. So I said that you have the inferior mesenteric ganglion innervating the descending colon, which is also your um, the descending colon and your sigmoid colon. And if we want to be more specific, the inferior mesenteric ganglion, inferior mesenteric ganglion, uh, gives off these when 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 is traveling, right? If we have the inferior mesenteric, we have the inferior mesenteric artery like this, comes out right, and it gives off this left colic branch or artery, right? And then it gives off this blood supply to the descending colon then that means that the inferior mesenteric ganglion, which is probably over here, is going to give off these plexi of nerves that travel on this to get to the col to get to the descending colon. We call this plexus of nerves the left colic plexus. So I know, you, I know some of you guys have told me, man, there was no repeats on that. All you told me to look at some repeats, look at old exams, but none of it was the same. Look at this. These are from two different years of exams, and they're all asking the same thing in different ways. But the, but the subject matter is still the same. Parasympathetic, sympathetic innervation to the GI. What do you need to know? One of them is half of, half of the GI is vagal, up in, uh, and then it switches to pelvic splanchnic. Where? At the splenic flexure. Sympathetic. It follows arteries. If you know your if you know your anatomy, then you know these answers. Um, now this right here is a high yield topic. Right here, we're gonna talk about uh, how does propagation work, right? How does food travel through the GI, and what are the players involved? Well, ultimately, the idea is this, right? Like I said earlier, the idea is to get this bolus of food traveling this way. We do that by contracting. We're going to contract the circular layer. The circular layer contracts and it pushes it this way. Kind of like when you squeeze the toothpaste, the tube of a toothpaste, you know, to cause the toothpaste to come out. Same thing. Same thing, right? But there is, there is somewhat of a science to it. And he talks about it right here. And there's two parts to propagation, to, to, to this propulsion. Peristaltic propulsion, right? Um, you have a propulsive segment. You also have a receiving segment, right? So the propulsive segment is where the contraction of the inner circular layer is happening, and the receiving segment is where the um, relaxation of the circular layer is 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 happening. So let me just let me just talk more about this. Uh, so like I said, um, right here is the is the propulsion is going on right here, also known as the area of contracting contraction. And then you have an area relaxation, which is the receiving segment, right? This is the one that receives the bolus. Um, basically, so remember what I said. You have the muscularis externa, right? The muscularis externa consists of if, if I were to if I were to draw if I were to cut your 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 you know um, your small intestine, 
you know, give you like a cross-sectional layer, it'll, it'll look like this, right? Um, the muscularis externa, if I were to focus on that, you'll have a inner circular layer and you'll have an outer longitudinal layer, right? So this is your inner circular layer and then this will be your outer longitudinal. And then if I were to draw it this way, so um, try it better too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this right here is your inner circular layer, and this right here is your outer longitudinal layer. So the way this works is um, basically you have a bolus of food, right, that's traveling right here. How do you get that bolus of food to keep going forward? Well, you're going to constrict the, you're going to contract the inner circular layer to clamp down, to clamp down, and it's going to push the food forward. Now, what is your outer longitudinal layer doing? What is that doing while this is happening? While this is happening in the propagation segment, the outer longitudinal layer is relaxed. It's not doing anything. So you guys probably want to know, okay, what's making your inner circular layer contract, right? That's going to be acetylcholine. Acetylcholine and also substance P. Acetylcholine and substance P are your motor excitation neuron, neurotransmitters that are going to cause the inner circular layer to contract and move that bolus of food forward. Okay, so you throw the football, right? So who's going to catch it? Is the receiving segment. The receiving segment is where the dilated segment, right? So it's dilated. How is it dilated? Well, over here, you're contracting the inner circular layer. Over here, you're going to relax it. Who's doing the relaxing? Nitric oxide and basointestinal, basoactive intestinal peptide. These guys are inhibitory neurotransmitters who are going to inhibit, um, uh, uh, who are going to inhibit, who are going to relax the inner circular layer. So they're going to relax the inner circular layer. And all this is doing so far is, is, is moving it from one part to another, the bolus so far, right? You're just moving one part to another. But you got to make the small intestine smaller, too, behind the bolus so that you can keep moving forward, right? And what I'm saying right here is that what is happening to the, lo to the, to the longitudinal layer, to the, outer circular, to the outer longitudinal layer, the outer longitudinal layer is actually getting smaller in the receiving segment. It's constricting. It's contracting, right? It gets smaller, so that that way it can that way the bolus can keep on going forward. In addition to you know the inner circular layer moving forward as well. What's acting over here though? What's causing the outer longitudinal layer to contract? Same guy that makes the inner circular layer contract, acetylcholine. And that's how you have peristalsis movement. Just has a really simplified slide of that right here. Um, all of it, you know, from from a vagal innervation, right? So over here, the in the in the propulsive segment, the inner circular layer is being contracted, is going to contract by substance P and acetylcholine. Um, and then the re receiving segment is going to be relaxed. The inner circular layer is going to be relaxed by VIP and nitric oxide. And the, don't forget though, at the same time though, right here, the outer longitudinal layer is being contracted by acetylcholine. And this is just, you know, how first aid kind of kind of talks about these guys. Um, again, as I said right here, you have VIP, the basoactive intestinal polypeptide. Um, this is going to be being released by your parasympathetic ganglia. And what it does is, like I said, relax smooth muscle. Um, then you also have nitric oxide, and like I said, this one also is doing re smooth muscle relaxation, right?
and then just to he, he just throws back that earlier slide where you know he introduced you know acetylcholine being um, excitatory and then nitric oxide and BIP being inhibitory or, or you know relaxation in peristaltic movement. So with that background, let's go ahead and answer this question. All right, 78 says, peristaltic propulsion of the bolus along the GI tract requires which of the following actions in the propulsive segment? So what's happening in the propulsive segment? Two things are happening, right? Two things are happening. First, you have the inner circular layer is being contracted, stimulated to, to close. Who's doing that? The person doing that is two people, acetylcholine and substance P. What else is going on? The outer longitudinal layer is relaxing. Now, no one's really doing that. It's just relaxing because it's not being contracted. It's not being stimulated by acetylcholine. So what's the answer here that is going on in the propulsive segment? So is the outer longitudinal layer contracting? No, it's not. If the question said what's going on in the receiving segment, that would be the answer. B says relaxation of the smooth muscles. Okay, if you want to split hairs, yeah, the outer longitudinal is relaxing, but let's see if we can find a better answer. I'll put that in the maybe pile. Release of nitric oxide. In the, and if we're talking about the receiving segment, yeah, that's true, but not in the propulsive segment. In the propulsive segment, the only guys who are being released are acetylcholine substance P. So C is wrong. D says the release of substance P. Okay, that sounds right. I'm, I'm going to look at this. Let me just read the rest of the answers. Release the VIP. Like I said, if this were talking about the receiving segment, then that would be right. However, we're talking about the propulsive segment, so E is wrong. So if you want to split hairs, you can say B, but the best answer here, the best answer is D. The best answer is D. Because it's substance P and acetylcholine who are causing the inner circular layer to contract, to constrict, and, and that's going to, to um, cause the bolus to move forward. There's another question. It says, in the neural regulation of peristaltic smooth muscle, the myotary plexus activation of both the propulsive and receptive segments is accomplished by which of the following neurons? Okay, so they're asking about propulsive and receptive segments. What neuron... What, what, what stimulation, what neurons are involved with both of those? Both of those. Like I said, when we're talking about the propulsive segment, and then you have the receiving segment, um, in the propulsive segment, the inner circular layer is being stimulated to contract by acetylcholine by acetylcholine and substance P. In the receiving segment, the, the inner circular layer is, is, is being relaxed by uh, nitric oxide and VIP. The outer longitudinal layer, the outer longitudinal layer is being contract constricted by acetylcholine. As you can see, What's involved in both is acetylcholine. Choline, cholinergic neurons. Neurons that are releasing acetylcholine, neurons that are releasing acetylcholine are the ones that are involved in both of these segments. Excitatory motor neuron only. That, that, that's, no, that's not true. Um, inhibitory motor neuron only, sensory neuron no. Um, so here we have, he talks a little bit about the anatomy of the stomach right here. Um, why is this? Like I said, the, the stomach serves as a, as a, as a reservoir for, for food. And that reservoir mostly happens right here at the fundus. Um, preparatory chamber. So right here is where you have all that released and the, the fundus and the and the um, 
in the in the body in the antrum is where you have a lot of the digestion occur occurring. A lot of digestion occurs there, and it's preparing the food, like it's blending the food like a blender, preparing it so it can be released into the duodenum, and you can have like more digestion and absorption. And then the emptying mechanism occurs right here at the pyloric uh, sphincter as it opens up, and the stomach constricts. Uh, it's gonna move that bolus of food into the duodenum for further digestion and absorption. Uh, so gastric emptying, gastric emptying depends on time. Like I said, let's say you go to food corner, you 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 eat their butter chicken on on Monday on Tuesdays, I think Fridays or Saturdays, I forgot when. You eat it right, so that means you have this much volume this much volume in your in your stomach right so your stomach distends right your stomach distends let's just run this let's just run this back let's just run this back this is a good point right here your stomach distends because of the food inside right it sends that message to your brain guess what message comes back now vagal stimulation and what's that gonna do? It's gonna tell this nerve to release GRP. And what's GRP gonna do? It's gonna tell the G cell to release gastrin. And what's gastrin gonna do? Gastrin is going to gastrin is going to stimulate the um, parietal cell to secrete hydrochloric acid. And, and then gastrin is also going to tell the ECL cell to secrete histamine. And what's histamine going to do? Histamine is going to tell the parietal cell to secrete acid. What else is the vagal nerve going to do? The vagal nerve is going to secrete acetylcholine, and that acetylcholine is going to tell the parietal cell to secrete acid. And when it's all long and done, the vagal nerve is also going to tell a bunch of these, all of these D cells to secrete somatostatin. And what does somatostatin do? It turns everything off, right? It's a stat, stat stasis. It turns everything off. Um, and then you know that CCK is, is one of the main ones that tell the, the stomach to, to empty. What am I saying with this? Is that gastric emptying is not, is, is really not linear. As you can see, when we have a full stomach, we're quick at digestion. You see the slope of this line is quick when we, have, when we start off with a full stomach. When we start off with a full stomach, you can kind of draw a line like this with a sharp slope. After time, as our digestion and gastric emptying moves along, and we have low levels of volume in our stomach, digestion begins to slow down. Look at the slope of this line. So gastric emptying, like I'm saying, is something that's not linear. Um, we begin to like store food as, as, we, as we empty our stomach. It begins to become stored and we begin to digest less. Uh, this is just something that's interesting. Like I said, your, your stomach's really like a blender. Um, remember how we said over here, over here in this slide, he talked about how, how the, the antrum and pyloric region uh, are, are kind of like preparatory chambers. The like I'm when I, what he's trying to say is that your stomach's like a blender for real, for real. And this is how it works. Right here, the pyloric sphincter is constricted, meaning that it's closed. Right, it's shut. It's closed. Nothing's coming out of there. And and you have food. You know, being being you have boluses coming down over here, and then you have these these peristaltic contractions that squeeze your stomach, it goes plip, plop, plip, plop. Though you can hear your stomach sounds, right? When you guys have like stomach, stomach pain and stuff like that. That's your stomach working like a blender to force, force these contexts of food forward and backward and forward and backward in your stomach. And that's what like mechanically digests your food in the stomach. It's real interesting. It's real interesting, not the high yield. Um, so how do you, you know, defecate? Um, like I was saying, as you digest your food, as it moves along, um, you have it begin to collect in your rectum. As it collects in your rectum, it's going to distend 
your rectum or stretch it. When your rectum stretches, it's going to send that signal to the brain. And the brain's going to send the signal back down and say, hey, it's time to go. And we call that the involuntary defecation reflex. Involuntary because it's going to tell your stomach, it's going to, it's going to tell you that, that you need to use the restroom. And it's also going to open your internal anal sphincter. Now, at your anus, you have two sphincters. You have an external anal sphincter and you have an internal anal sphincter. What's the difference? The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle. It's involuntary. The external anal sphincter is skeletal. It's voluntary. So even though you have to go, you guys ever been like on a, on a, on a, in a car or in a bus and you have to go? What's stopping you from going? This voluntary contraction of the external anal sphincter. You can stop yourself, right? Um, there's some argument there. Some scientists say that you can stop yourself from you know, defecating up to a certain amount of, of neuronal output. And you know, eventually they say that the parasympathetics take over and force you to defecate. But for the most part, um, the external anal sphincter is purely voluntary. There's argument there, though. Um, so how do you voluntarily defecate? Well, obviously you have to. You know, we we've all we've all you know done this. So you have to create pressure in your in your abdomen to push it out, right? To do this voluntarily, you're gonna voluntarily push it out and defecate, and you do this by creating pressure, and also by voluntarily relaxating the external anal sphincter, right? Because the internal internal anal sphincter is already relaxed. It's already open, right? Think of this as a double door. In order to get, in order for you to get the, in order for you to get, you know, the, um, in order for you to get the feces out, you need to open two doors. The first door is the internal anal sphincter. The second door is the external anal sphincter. This one is involuntary and this one is voluntary. So this one, this one opens once the feces gets collected right there. Now you have to open this one, and you do this by thinking about it. You open it. Now you create the pressure. How does this happen? How does this happen? Um, so basically, um, it, it, this is the way it happens. So you close the glottis, right? You close the glottis, which is the, the opening of, of, your, of your trachea. Um, Take a deep breath, you know, you close it, and, and, and you, you, you take a deep breath. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on. You close the glottis, which is the opening of your, yeah, 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 you're, you're shaking. Um, you, you, you take a deep breath, which is going to cause your diaphragm to descend, and then you contract your abdominal walls, right? If I were to draw your chest, your body, uh, I could draw it like this, right? So this is the person, right? So what you're gonna do is close this off, and then you have right here are your guts, your abdomen, and then right here is your lungs, right? So when you take a deep breath, you're going to push your diaphragm down, right? You're gonna contract it. So it's gonna move this line a little bit more down. At the same time, you're going to you're going to contract your abdominal muscles. And all of that is going to cause pressure, intra-abdominal pressure, so that it can push all of that stuff out. Uh, and just here's just a, just a really good diagram of the, the reflexes, the um, defecation reflexes. As I said, the, ex the external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. The uh, internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle, so that's one of them is voluntary, one involuntary um, the way it works is this step one is the feces goes into the rectum and distends it so this stimulates stretch receptors the stretch receptors send that signal to 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 the sensory fibers um, you know and then and then you have a reflex of a spinal reflex is initiated in which parasympathetic motor efferent fibers stimulate contraction of the rectum and sigmoid colon and they relax the internal anal sphincter, right? So this is a reflex. So the brain, I'm sorry, so the brain is not involved. This is pure, this is just a pure reflex amongst the pelvic splanchnic nerves, right? 
the pelvic spanking the pelvic spanking uh, nuclei receive receive the signal of distension from the rectum and then you have um, the pelvic uh, sympathetics going to go ahead and contract the sigmoid colon, contract the rectum, and relax the internal anal sphincter. Then the ball is in your court and it's up to you. If it is convenient to defecate, meaning that you're on a toilet, then you're going to go ahead and voluntarily um, relax the external anal sphincter so that feces can pass along with, you know, creating that intra-abdominal pressure to aid with the defecation. Um, so this is basically how it works. Um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, all of these things are being stretched as the bolus travels along, and this is going to send a signal to your brain, and then your brain sends a signal back to your uh, colon. So this is this is this is if you understand this, you can kind of understand the the pathology behind ulcers, right? Here he's saying that the gastric mucosa is is found in two regions. So oxytinic is just another word for like parietal cell or like acid. Um, so the oxytinic gland area, which is 85% of the stomach, is con constitutes your cardia, which is over here, fundus, which is a pure, in your pylori area.